a large, extra large. Women's you rainwear. Now we just need the rain to go with it. Where's that El Nino? It's an El Nino We're so year, pathetic. So we it's a good year to keep get a little bit of drizzle and get all excited and dance the happy dance. Oh, okay. like that's your rain. Opinion. I'm beginning to doubt that. And the winner is? The winner is Pat Cottrell. Oh, yeah. She'll take it where it does rain. Yes, she will. I was wondering what that was. Very nice. And a raincoat for the farmer's market. Yeah. Oh, very nice for the farmer's market. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Singleton. You're going to the sweet shop after the meeting. It's the Steelers fan. Uh -huh. Steelers fan. Not uh, Pittsburgh, right? You are over the I think it's Pittsburgh. And for mugs. I mean, that's Yeah, he does. He wants it. Sharon is here and he wants them. Jackie stuffed this box. What is it for? It's a box of electronics. <laughs> it's stuff. It's a thing for my boys to tinker with. Oh. A couple cell phones in there. Okay, who's next pick? Have, go ahead, pick something for her boys to tinker with. All right. And that's exactly what he did. He picked something for her boys to tinker with. Let me look at something. That's me. That's Yay! You. <laughs> Your boys can start tinkling. My boys can tinkling. Yeah. Tinkering. Tinkering. Oh. Thank you. There was only one name besides yours in there, Jackie. That's how you win. You stuff the box. <laughs> No cheating, Ann. Lots of your friends have names in here. This is rigged. <laughs> Mr. Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Any other requests? Oh, wow. it's thick and well padded. Must be a big gift card. Uh, Ann, do I have to split it with you? Yeah. <laughs> Any other request? <laughs> this is beautiful. Eat your heart out, Archie. I'm watching it. Let's dig it deep. This is for the set of glasses and serving platter. The platter is actually very good. Those glasses, too. Any better than $25? With the case. Very nice.
Look, we have such a light group. Uh, no, I don't know what that was. It's not for sale. We're yeah. trying to raffle yeah. off that football. No, no. no. <laughs> Don Drysdale, I'd be excited. I love Don Drysdale. It's a little bit soft, so I thought maybe it belonged oh, to the Patriots. Late, late game. I thought the maybe it would belong to the Patriots. Don Don <laughs>
built into some glasses. So what I'd like to do is possibly invite the people to come down and um, demonstrate them for us. And I'm hoping if they, well, you know me, if they're going to come down and demonstrate, I'm going to see if they can donate a pair. Um, we can raffle that pair off to people only with oxygen on. But look at her oxygen cannula. Can't They're beautiful. It. You can't see the nasal cannula. Now, obviously, it's not for high flow, but it, uh, it look at how beautiful that looks. You don't have how that. Big of, how big a flow is it for? Up to five. Up to five. Well, that's, well, that's pretty, pretty good. big. Yeah. Can you? It can be continuous, but a little loud. And Microphones. I guess it can be continuous, but you would just run out of oxygen very quickly. So it's it's kind of, yeah, it's, cool. it's 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 really kind of neat. So if you want to just kind of look at her real close, <laughs> stare, stare at her. Well, the thing is, is that you can't see it. You don't notice it when she walks in and stuff like that. It goes through your a tube in the earpiece and then goes out around the glasses and then down into the cannula. So and they're prescription glasses. They can be prescription. They don't have to be. So you just order the cannula, and then you attached it to your glass? They, they no, do it for you. They do it for They're you. They're special glasses mm -hmm. that the oxygen runs through the oh, earpiece. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then and the back of her neck is the cannula right here. Got it? You see that? Uh -huh. So it just doesn't go across your face. Yeah. Right. right. It's attached to the glasses. These have been around for many, many yeah, years. Yeah. They, it's called OxyView. They just never took off um, like you would like it to take off. But it's some, it's a different form of delivering oxygen. And I just want you guys to know that there's several different ways. We have the Oxymizer. We have the standard cannula. Your Oxymizer is beautiful because you decorate it. We have the OxyView. So you need to know what's out there for you. Okay, so I just wanted her to kind of... No, that's why I'm going to ask him if he wants to come out and donate a pair or even half price it. But I'm not going to even say half price. I'm going to. With prescription, with bifocals, with all the bells and whistles, it was just under $500. Oh, that's not bad at all. And then, it, you know, depending on what you want, you can get regular, if you don't need glasses, clear. So it starts at like maybe $225. Yes, these little pieces come off, and you just put it onto the nose piece, and you adjust it to fit your nose. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah. Pat had a question. Uh, can you, will he do them without the glasses, and you can take them and get your own lens put in? Well, this is an ophthalmologist, isn't it? Ophthalmologist? Yes, it's, at, it's only available through ophthalmologists, and there's only one in the Los Angeles area that does it. There's one in Lakewood. He's in Lakewood. There's one in San Diego. There are quite a few up in Northern California. So you're kind of committed to buying the glasses through him. Just something to think about. Again, we'd like you to have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, I don't, not every ophthalmologist can fit these particular glasses. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain lens and a certain way to put them in. So you couldn't just buy the glasses and then go to any ophthalmologist because they may not be able to put, fit them. Already in San Diego, up north and in San Diego. Thank you for your time. It's nice. Thank you. All righty. We'll work on getting that guy down here and trying to get him to donate something to us. It will be nice. Okay, well, now that we are done with our raffle, um, let me go get my cheat sheet here. I've got my glasses on. I don't mind getting my cheat sheet. We're going to announce our guest speaker today, and we are fortunate to have. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, we're fortunate to have with us Lauren Kawabata. Did I say that right? And she is a pharmacist here at Little Company of Mary Hospital, interning a residency here with us. She's already, um, she, you know, the smartest people in our hospital, guys, is our pharmacists. They're incredible. So she's going to talk to you about medications, respiratory medications. Um, again, I left the cards out there if you have a question you want to bring it up. But she's, it's a question and answer time. Um, I left this out in case. So let's give her a warm welcome to Laura. She's a pharmacy doctor. Lauren Kawabata. I just graduated from USC School of Pharmacy this past May, and so I'm doing my postgraduate residency training at Little Company of Mary in Torrance. Um, if you guys have any questions, we can just just get started. You say you went to School of Pharmacy. Exactly. How does your education mean? How many years? Yeah, so um, in order to go to most pharmacy schools, you have to have a bachelor's Bachelor's degree? They couldn't hear the question. Oh, sorry. You put it kind of close. Okay. The question was, like, how long is pharmacy school? What do you need to do to get through pharmacy school um, to be a pharmacist? So um, I did my undergrad training at UCLA in biochemistry. I got my bachelor's of science that way. And most pharmacy schools do require you to have a bachelor's degree of some sort. Um, so that's where I did my, you know, prerequisites. Um, pre-farm type of classes, so to speak, and then I went to USC, which is a um, school of pharmacy, and it's another four-year program there, so a total of eight years after high school of schooling. Thank you. Right, so we have to um, take a national exam and a California board exam. Um, for mainly law, uh, the law portion of it. So there are two exams for us, and then if we want to specialize, we can take more exams um, that way too. So there's like critical care, there's oncology, um, there's a lot of other sports <coughs> board specialties you can go into. Um, for now, I'm planning to do my pharmacotherapy, which is kind of a general one. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> Good question. Questions, guys? Dance. 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 Uh, albuterol <clears throat> is considered to be a fast-acting <clears throat> uh, medication. How fast does it work? So that's probably one of the <coughs> fastest of the um, bronchodilators, we call them, so they re help relax the lungs. Um, it's probably the fastest out of all of them. It's very short-acting. Um, something that does come up is some patients... <coughs> Um, don't remember to um, prime it when they first get it. So when they um, first pick up their prescription, you have to make sure you prime it so the medication is readily available to you um, when you need it in the case of a shortness of breath or wheezing or you know an asthma attack. So um, just make sure you always prime it beforehand. I just like to tell people that. Um, but yeah, it should be pretty fast acting. What do you mean by prime it? So... Um, it's in the directions, and they should be telling you this, but you actually have to shake it first and spray it away from you a couple times, and that activates the medication, so um, it gets it ready to be used. So make sure you do that. Pretty much all the inhalers that are aerosolized, um, so even like Simvacort, for example, you have to prime it before using it. Uh, Striva uh, is a very expensive medicine, and I'm just kind of waiting for the... Uh, E even with, with insurance, it's still qu quite, quite expensive. Um, how long are the patents for these drugs? Because I presume once the patent expires, then they can come out with all the generic brands of these drugs. Uh, so that's a very good question about patents and um, when generics can come out. Someone actually asked me that earlier today. And um, to be honest, I don't know the exact time frame that they have it, but they, these co drug companies have their, um, you know, like an intellectual right to have these, you know, just uh, drugs and medications. So when the patent does end, other uh, drug companies can start making that product generic. Um, and so then that's when the price comes down. But I'm, I'm not sure of a specific time frame. 
and it also depends on when they filed for that patent, and they can also extend the patent too if they want to open it up for a new indication. Um, that's another way they can extend the patent. So it, it's pretty. It depends on the on the medication. Hello? Speaking of Pro Air, Pro Albuterol, last month I paid twenty-three dollars. This month I paid forty-seven. Uh, why? Um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, I'm not very. I'm not very experienced with outpatient. I've worked inpatient, you know, during my intern years as a pharmacist, and now, so I'm not really familiar with why the price changed. Um, if anyone else knows, that'd be great. She said she might be able to answer it here. I got a letter from my intern company saying that the copay was going to go up on certain medications. She said her copay was going up on certain medications. I got a letter, a notification from my insurance. So that may be the reason, I don't, you know. And Thank then they you. showed you, I, they gave me a list of alternative medications that I could take. And I think it was for Rita. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, they can't if um, and for insurance purposes, they, I know that they can do like alternatives, but that's something that uh, the doctor will have to okay as well. Um, so they'll have to go through that. Another question over here. <clears throat> I take a drug that costs me a thousand dollars a month. However, if I get the drug from Canada, I pay a hundred dollars a month. Is there anything I should be concerned about? Um, I, if, if, so it's an FDA-approved drug in the U.S.? Yeah. I mean, I can't support using outside of, um, you know, outside prescriptions, because, you know, we don't necessarily know what's in there if they're manufactured, you know, by a different person. Um, so I can't really speak to that, but there are a number of people who do use, you know, medications from other countries and stuff, too. Um, but I, I can't really say I support the use of a non-approved you know, medication here. Okay, Edna has a question. Edna? Hi, I'm taking Edserca for my pulmonary hypertension. Tw it's now 2700 a month. I'm not paying that because I, I guess Medicare and my insurance are paying. But that seems ridiculous. It used to be eleven hundred last year. Now it went up to twenty-seven something a month. Wow! Wow! Um, you know, I was having a discussion with you know someone else here today, and um, you know the pharmaceutical company is really a business. It's a big business, and they do things like that. And it's not right for patients or for anyone that needs the medication. But you know that's the industry. So. I'm really sorry to hear that. It's very frustrating, I'm sure. Okay, here we go. I got a lot of, I take a lot of different pills, and I take them all at once. So should I be concerned about interactions between different pills? Or? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. It was about interactions, and if you take all your medications at the same time. Um, so sometimes there can be interactions, so it's very spe uh, drug-specific on what they are. Um, for example, antacids with some of the um, antibiotics can prevent it from being absorbed as well, which would be really bad because then you're not treating your infection adequately. Um, but that's just like one example. We can, you know, if you want to ask me later or for specifics, we can go over them. Um, another example I know when patients will split up their medications is for blood pressure medication. So sometimes they, they'll take all their blood pressure medications in the morning and they'll feel the, the effects of having too many blood pressure lowering meds early on in the day. So some people will split those up so they don't feel have that low blood pressure early on in the day. Um, so that's another time when you can split them up too. But we can go over that if you want to ask me about your specifics. Talking about drugs and taking at a specific time, if you split your drugs in half, you, I've been told that the doctor says you will level out the drugs effectiveness as, a co as opposed to having them in valleys and peaks. 
Is that a true statement? Um, it can be. It depends on the medication. So some medications is what we call concentration dependent. Others are time dependent. So you want, and then like you said, there can be peaks and troughs with these medications. So if you do split the dose, you're not hitting as high of a peak. Um, you're not hitting as those high concentrations in your body to treat it. So it does depend on the drug and the properties of it. Um, so again, it's kind of specific to what medications you can or cannot split or should should not split. Um, so we, if you have specifics, we can talk about that too. I have a question about if I, for example, uh, forgot to take my medication um, and I, it's due again at another time, uh, should I take it or should I not take it? That's a good um, question. <laughs> um, it depends how close it is to that next administration. Um, so if we're talking like a Q12 medication, I would say if it's within, um, if you like forget and you remember another like hour or two later after it's due, just go ahead and take that medication. But if, it, if it's closer to that second administration time, um, you don't want to necessarily take that medication then and take it again, because that's almost like doubling your dose at once. So okay. um, try to uh, see like it, how close it is to your next administration time um, to split it up. Perfect. Okay, anybody else have questions? Betsy has a question. Let me get you the mic. <clears throat> I, I have had a pulmonary, I've had a couple of patients tell me that their pulmonologists are telling them that with their inhalers, such as um, albuterols, Advair, Spireva, to space them out during the day, to take one in the morning and wait a couple hours, and take another one and wait a couple hours. Um, I'm not familiar with that. We've told them in the past to use the albuterol first for the rapid acting and then follow up. And my concern is if you wait a couple hours to take the next one, you're going to get busy and forget to take it. So how do you feel about that with the inhaled uh, combinations of drugs available today? I think you bring up a good point about forgetting to take it. I think it's more important to make sure you're on your maintenance medications and instead of forgetting to take it because that's one of the things that keeps you out of the hospital and from having an exacerbation is when you remember to take your maintenance medication. Um, and you're right, you do, it does help some people to take the fast-acting bronchodilator like albuterol first to help open up the airways so you can take in those other maintenance medications. And so you can properly inhale it. any problem with taking them back to back. Some people get short of breath though when they do in you know do the inhaler. So um, I mean if you need to take a you know break in between that's fine but I don't think there's any problem in terms of taking them like all at once. Okay, thank you. Another question over here? <laughs> Another one. <coughs> there was a article on TV about the expiration date of food and found out that there is no federal law, state law that specifies they have to put an expiration date on food. Is that the same with medicine and how is the date determined? Okay, so uh, medicine all have expiration dates. So when you look at, like if you have an actual physical bottle in front of you, it should have an expiration date on it and all medications will have that. Um, the way they determine it is when it's going through the studies to be approved, they look at how the drug acts in the body um, and to determine like what, what concentrations are needed to work. The expiration date is calculated as uh, when 90% of the drug action is still retained, meaning it lost 10% of its action. So that's how they determine what the expiration date is. So in theory, if you have a drug that expired yesterday, it still has 90% of its action as it did from when it was brand new. Um, so that's how the expiration dates work for medications. Um, when you get a, um, prescriptions dispensed to you from a pharmacy, they usually time it out by a year just because they don't know if, if, say you don't take your medication, they don't know if it gets contaminated. So you'll notice that if they bottle it in a separate bottle, 
it's usually a year expiration if it's not a sooner expiration on the actual bottle, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, expiration dates are calculated as 90% of action. <clears throat> I was told by my eye doctor that I should keep my eye drop in the refrigerator. Is that the same as most medicine? Um, some of the eye drops actually should be re refrigerated, such as Zalatan. That's like one of the refrigerated eye drops. There's other ones too. That's the one that comes to my mind right now. Um, not all medications should be refrigerated. Um, some of them actually should not be refrigerated at all. Um, but other ones, it's okay to if you want to. Um, it, again, it's drug specific. Uh, but if your doc, the eye drops, so some of them are supposed to be refrigerated. So that's not out of the ordinary. Do you guys get much interaction from the drug companies? Like, do the drug company reps stop by and meet with the pharmacists and tell them about new drugs that are about to go on the market or get you guys to a, a discount on a certain drugs if you move the drugs? You know, how much interaction is there between the typical pharmacist or the head pharmacist at a, you know, like a CVS pharmacy and drug company representatives? Are those representatives coming by the pharmacy all the time? and in my limited experience, I haven't seen too many drug reps come by, but I do know that they they do talk to uh, more like the administrative pharmacists rather than the, those staffing. So usually the bosses are the ones they'll talk to. It's a lot of times for like pricing and you know all that all that stuff too. But um, for a lot of healthcare systems, it's uh, based on a formulary, um, and so. The higher up people are the ones, and insurance companies, for example, too, have formularies who determine which ones are they're going to uh, keep on their formulary that you can use. Um, so some of the new medications you might hear aren't on formulary; they need prior off. Um, so it, it just depends who they talk to, when they talk to them, and um, so yeah, it, it's yeah, based on that. I have a question. Go ahead. I was told it takes Pareva first and then Advair after that. why you need to put those in order. If anything, I've heard to take your albuterol first to open up your airways to take your other medications, but I haven't really heard of a difference between Spiriva and Advair. And just a reminder for Spiriva, um, you actually are supposed to do it twice. You don't have to punch the pill and you know in the thing, you don't have to punch it twice, but it, make sure you, you inhale it twice. I know a lot of people forget that. Uh, I've been told to take certain medications at night before bed, specifically my statin drug and uh, a PPI, a meprazole. Is there a reason for that? PPI, the omeprazole, it's usually at least it's, as long as it's before meals. Um, you could take it at night. It's it's longer acting, so that one doesn't matter too much. But I mean, if you're taking it at night every day, that's that's fine. Um, the statins, it depends on which ones they are, but usually they tell you to take it at nighttime because that's when your body is making the cholesterol. So they want you to take the medication when your body is making the excess cholesterol to stop it from having that extra. Um, so that's why your statin um, usually is for nighttime, like for Simba statin. Um, that one definitely like at nighttime. Okay. I got a question about statin since you mentioned it. Statin, okay. I take a statin. Why can't I have a grapefruit? So grapefruit actually inhibits the, um, <laughs> the metabolism of the medication. So it's a drug interaction. So that's why they tell you not to take it with grapefruit. Well, there's also, there's a lot of medications that interact with statins, actually. Um, it can change how your max dose of your statin. Um, but yeah, there are interactions. But that's probably like the classic food drug interaction you hear about. Is it very dangerous if you do that? Because I take one every night, too. Mm -hmm. And then mom loves squirt, you know, the soda squirt, and it has grapefruit. And I kind of like it, too, but I I don't dare. So what what could happen if I did that? So with the um, the question was, like, a statin with grapefruit. So the danger with that is that it could potentially, it's preventing it from breaking down in your body. So you potentially can have more of it within your body. And so, so one of the um, major adverse reactions of statins could be muscle pain, 
and the, the more serious one being rhabdomyolysis, when you have breakdown of your muscle, your urine becomes a dark brown, and your... Um, oh, my God. Yeah. Forget this word. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> no more grapefruit. That's where the danger's coming from. They don't want this to happen or to accumulate. Um, so, <laughs> that's why. I have a question again. Um, it's about antibiotics, or actually... Um, let's see, not antibiotics. Yeah. The difference between generic and brand, are they less potent or are they just as good? Or can you say, wow, you go to pick it up and it's $90. Yeah. You know, could you say, is it okay to say, hey, can you give me a, the generic on it? And is, is it just as good? So, um, regards to brand and generics, um, the way a drug is classified as a generic is that it has to be shown to be the same as the brand. So you don't have to worry about it being less efficacious because um, they, in order for it to be manufactured as a generic, it has to be shown to be equivalent. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. The one positive thing about generic is that it is usually less expensive. Um, and if you need to, want to ask for a generic alternative, um, usually the pharmacies will give a generic um, unless otherwise specified, like the doctor on their prescriptions can check off, like if they, if you can do a substitution or if they only want brand as ordered. So um, your doctor can say they only want to give you a certain kind. Um, so if they were to say that, then the pharmacy will have to contact your doctor to ask if it's okay for generic. But usually, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and just go with generic. Okay, any other questions? This is some good things here. Here we go. about the drug Espriot. Um, I'm not, is that a new medication? I'm not 100. Yes, it is. Fairly new. Yeah. Fairly and what's it for? It's for pulmonary fibrosis. Oh, okay. The only thing else that I know. What's the name of it again? Es Espriot. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to look into that because I, I did hear about this, but I don't know that much about it yet. Uh, but I can look into it really quickly before you leave and I can okay. give you some information on it. Profenadone, also one of the ones that put pulmonary yeah. fibrosis, mm -hmm. very expensive. Profenadone? This is very expensive. Yeah, I'm in, if it's yeah. new, I'm assuming this yeah, is very, very expensive. Yeah, very expensive. It started off at 10000 Yeah, something like that. I think it's profenadone. It might be profenadone yeah. is the other name. You know what? It's amazing. Antibiotics, I mean, medications have two names. I go for the easy one, not the complicated one. No, I get a ton of emails every day of all these new medications. It's hard to keep up. So, we have a lot I out apologize. there right now. Okay. What was the other one that was for? Yes. Profenadone. Yes. Profenadone. Yeah. Another one? I don't remember. Oh, Profenadone and. I never heard of it. Okay. No. I don't know. I'll have to sharpen up on my. Okay. We're going to go right here. Pharmacies um, advertise giving shots flu shots, shingle shots, how safe truly is it to get your shot at a pharmacy? We've all been trained, I've been trained to give um, IM injections at, you know, at a pharmacy. I've given flu shots, pneumococcal shots, um, some of the travel ones for like subcutaneous like typhoid, yellow fever. We've all been trained to do it. It's perfectly safe um, and it's, you know, the good thing is that we're very accessible to the public. You can walk into any community pharmacy and they can give you, administer you a, a vaccination if needed. Um, and so we've all been trained, so yeah. Do you have another question? My question, really, I, I should have explained, it was not on your training, but how do you know that it's safe to give the medication to the patient? How do we know it's safe to administer? No, to oh. give the, the medication you're giving. Yeah, like, I mean, how do you know the patient is supposed to get a shingle shot? So, um, usually on the outpatient, they'll ask if they've ever received the vaccination. Um, hopefully, you have a record of the ones you receive. For shingles um, and a lot of and pneumococcal, for example, um, they're age age related when you receive them or not. So. Um, They'll, they'll ask you if you've ever received it before. Um, and so if you haven't, then you could be indicated to receive it. I don't know if that answers the question. 
We try to follow up with the, um, you as much as possible, and hopefully you know from your doctor, or your doctor can even write a prescription or a recommendation to, that, you know, this is what I want you to get, and you can get it done wherever. Yeah, I've seen in the past where patients will get a prescription for the shingle shot, take it to their local pharmacy, and have the shingle shot. So um, usually there is a prescription along with it. Do you have any other? Well, I'm using the shingle shot as an example because I went to my oncologist, or I'm sorry, I went to my internist and said, I've had the shingles, I understand I'm supposed to have the shingle shot. And he said, hmm, I don't know. Go to your pulmonary doctor and ask him. I went to my pulmonary doctor, who I think knows everything about everything, and he said, hmm, I don't know. Go to your oncologist. I went to my oncologist and he said, absolutely not. So, but I thought, you know, you hear you've had the shingles, you're supposed to get the shingle shot. If I go to a pharmacy and say I need the shingle shot, well, I might not be here today. So how, you know, it's, so that's kind of a scary thing. Right, that's a good point. That brings up like the disconnect between inpatient, outpatient, and all your different physicians that you're seeing. Um, I'm assuming that you could not get it, the shingles vaccine, because it's a live vaccination. And so sometimes uh, with different disease states, um, you can't get a live vaccine. So that would be shingles. It could be um, the chickenpox shot, which is similar to the shingles. It could be some of those travel medicine like that are also live vaccines. Um, so there's, you're right. That's a very good point that you know we wouldn't necessarily know that you can't get a shingles. So it's very important that you all stay up to date on, you know, what's going on because little pieces of information like that, like I didn't know, uh, would be very important to determining if it's okay to give you this, this vaccination or this medication. So it's important to keep everyone in the loop when you um, ever see um, your doctors or any new doctors. Very good point. Nancy? The flu shot, they came out with a higher dosed one this year. Oh, I was wondering why my voice was echoing. <laughs> that actually crept up on me. Um, and some pulmonologists, or some doctors would say, yeah, that's fine, and others would say, no, don't wait for the, you know, do the high. There was some discrepancy and different opinions. How do you feel, especially for a population that's high risk for consequences from flu? Um, should it be the higher dose flu vaccine or should it be the regular flu vaccine? Um, you know, I'm not sure about that, but I do just want to emphasize that if the time gap was a big time gap before the high dose was available, it's probably more important to get that vaccine early on because, you know, you don't want to get the flu and you know, have something happen. Um, in terms of what high dose versus low dose, I, I don't know which one is necessarily better. Um, but the low dose, the you know, the lower one has been approved and it's been used, so I don't see anything wrong with getting that one. Um, as long as you get your vaccine, I think that's the most important thing. Right, ultimately. The, 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 the high dose that he sent me to the pharmacy because he didn't have it. Okay, so uh, Preston's doctor said, I want you to get the high dose and sent him to a pharmacy because he didn't have it in his office. I know one of our pulmonologists said, find a high dose. I want you to have the high dose. I think it can also... You had both. Well, you've got all your bases covered then. <laughs> you know, it might be an age thing too where they want a certain age group to get the higher dose. Um, I'm thinking that might be why they wanted it. I don't know, but... Would, did the higher dose cover more varieties of virus, or am I thinking about the pneumovax? With well, with that? the, the other one, wait, the are you talking about dose, or um, how many strains they cover? How many a, strains? A str okay, well then that's different. I would say get the quad, the quad, the four one, the one with four, because it covers more strains. More strains. Yeah, so, if, yeah, I thought you were talking about, like, there was a new dose. No. Size. But, yeah, there's a trivalent yeah. and quadrivalent. Um, tri meaning it covers three, and then quad meaning four. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend getting the four. In the end, like, people get either one, too, so. Uh, my internist uh, recommended the one for old people. <laughs> and, and. <laughs> well, anyway, I fit the bill. And it, it was just the, it was 
for it was made manufactured. No, and he didn't want me to get that. No, there was one that was specifically made for older people. There's a lot of brand names out there of the flu vaccine, so that's also possible. Um, there are different brands out there. There's actually a lot, like for peds, like they can only get certain brands, and yeah, there's a lot of different um, brands out there. What is the difference between low dose aspirin? and the regular dose of aspirin. The doctors keep recommending low dose. The high dose helps me to sleep. So I take the high dose. I haven't really heard high dose helping with sleep, but that's a new one. <laughs> um, well, low dose has been shown to be good for preventative of like heart attacks and stroke. It's been shown that high dose, you don't really need to have 325 to prevent that. The 81 milligrams can do that on its own. Um, and then with a th higher dose, you have the risk of um, more chance of bleeds. Um, and if you don't have like food in your stomach, that helps prevent that, for example. So definitely the high dose can lead to a greater risk of bleed. So there's kind of that risk versus benefit with that. Um, most people are on um, 81 milligrams, but I have seen instances where people are on 325 milligrams if they are at super high risk for stroke and the doctor deems that risk versus benefit. Um, more in favor of the higher dose, but usually um, 81 milligrams is what's recommended. So they, they were going back in. Any other questions? Do we have any? Oh, well, I'm going back to the, the I was about to say herpes, but. Um, uh, shingle? Shingle. But anyway, I, I guess I'm somewhere in the recesses of my brain. I thought if you have had shingles, you already had the immunity, so you didn't need the shot. But it sounds like what you're saying is even though they've had shingle, they may also need the shot. Is that yes. correct? Right. Yes. So actually, shingles is chicken pox. It's the same virus. Right. So, you know, if you've had chicken pox, you're at risk for shingles, too. And likewise, if you have shingles, you can get a reactivation of it, too. I mean, I had the, shing I had the shot for shingles. You guys, the reservoir. Yeah. As far as the whooping cough in L.A. County, it's epidemic. And um, how often, I just recently had a new grandchild, and the doctors are not letting anyone near that new grandchild unless you get the whooping cough or the 3-MMR. How, but they're saying, which is, uh, I thought it was good for 10 years. So, well, first of all, uh, I want to back up. MMR is different from whooping cough. Whooping cough is like is Tdap. Yeah. No, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, so with whooping cough, um, the there's a newer. It's not. It's kind of new. A uh, formulation called Tdap, and that one is good for 10 years, and you need the booster of I think just um, TD thereafter. Um, so Tdap is the newer one. I think before it was like Dtap or something like that. Um, so now the recommendation is that any adult is supposed to get a dose of Tdap. So they, if they have gotten the old one before, they still need the new dose of the Tdap. And how um, often? That one, well, that one you only need one dose of it. And then I think you have to booster it with uh, TD every 10 years. Yeah. But uh, it's likely that your doctor thinks that they didn't get Tdap because it is fairly new. So that might be it. He wants them to get the Tdap. And it's kind of confusing because they all sound the same, Dtap, Tdap, Td. And it just depends on how much of each one's in, uh, each component is in there. So that's why Tdap is a new recommendation. So if she had a brand new baby, a uh, grandbaby, and she went and had her Tdap, it takes, am I mistaken, does it take two weeks to activate before they can see the baby? I think it does take some time for our, our, your immune system to boost and um, respond to it, so it does take some time. Any other questions? You should be covered. She had it a year ago. They're thinking, telling her oh, that she yeah. needs it again, and she no. shouldn't need it. We'll have to write you a letter. No, yeah, you shouldn't need another <laughs> you should dab know. unless you got DTAP instead. <coughs> if it's TDAP, you should be covered. Any other questions? This has been kind of fun here. Oh, we got another question. What is the dose?
don't know if you ever had chicken pox. Would it hurt you to get the shingle shot? Um, I've asked a doctor, I've asked a pharmacist, several people, and nobody seems to be able to answer that question. Yeah, you know, I'm not, you know, at least with the varicella, which is uh, chicken pox. So the difference between chicken pox and the shingles is the dose.